In 2021, almost 40% of Denmark's energy came from low-carbon sources. In achieving this, Denmark was second only to Finland, which produced 53.21% of its energy from low-carbon sources. And well ahead of the EU overall, where less than 30% of total energy was low-carbon. What makes Denmark interesting though is the fact that in contrast with Finland and the rest of the EU, Denmark began its transition to clean energy relatively late. In the year 2000, only 7.1% of Denmark's energy was coming from low carbon sources in contrast with 20.41% for the EU and 37.63% for Finland. Denmark was once a major oil producing nation and relied heavily on coal for power generation. While it hasn't fully phased out oil yet, it is now driving the shift away from fossil fuels and pioneering innovation in wind energy. The country's coal phase-out, which has been legally mandated to happen by 2030, is also expected to take place earlier as both Orsted. Denmark's leading energy company, and Fjernvarme FYN, Denmark's leading district heating utility, have announced accelerated coal phase-out plans. Denmark also has ambitious goals to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 70% by 2030, a move that would make Denmark one of the leading players, second only to Finland. Which plans to be climate neutral by 2035, in the fight against climate change, not only in Europe, but even in the rest of the world? What enabled Denmark to make such a speedy transition and what can the rest of Europe, and the world, learn from Denmark's success? Denmark's success can be attributed to a range of social and political factors. It has long had stable and predictable energy policies with a high level of participation from both public and private actors. Denmark has also been one of the frontrunners in imposing carbon taxes, including taxes and policies to push the adoption of EVs and also pioneered CO2 emissions trading for the power sector in 2000. All of this is scoured by Denmark's relatively flat social structure and high level of trust in Danish and public institutions, both factors that make policy making easier and more effective. Denmark also promotes energy efficiency in industry, and uses energy tax for enhanced decarburization in multiple sectors including transportation. Denmark has a long history of energy audits and energy savings advisory provided by local distribution companies. This has resulted in standardized reporting templates and methods, which made it easy for Denmark to set mandatory targets for industry much earlier than other countries were able to do so. Due to its flexibility, simplicity and cost-effectiveness, the system has high rates of acceptance that have made it an overarching success. Denmark has also been willing to back technological innovation in green energy, which the Danish government has generously supported with public policy schemes turning Denmark into a global hub for wind energy innovation over time. New innovative projects are also currently on the horizon. These include large-scale carbon capture and sequestration and low-carbon energy islands of which the latter are particularly interesting. Denmark has a reliable, interconnected power grid that makes renewable energy easy to integrate into their existing network. It also makes it easy to export energy when wind is blowing and Denmark has more than it needs, and import it when there isn't enough. Lastly, Denmark also benefits from geography that makes it well equipped to develop its wind energy capabilities. The Yom Kippur War of 1973 and the Iranian Revolution of 1979 disrupted oil supplies from the Middle East, and created difficulties for nations, including Denmark that relied on the region for their energy. In the aftermath of these events, Denmark re-evaluated its energy policy and began to focus on developing domestic oil and gas resources in the North Sea, converting thermal plants from oil to coal, and pushing for more diverse energy sources by developing expertise in nuclear and renewable energy. Support for the development of renewables initially only came via energy taxes. Starting from the 1980s however, the Danish government began introducing policy changes to support the development of renewables, especially wind. These included subsidies that initially covered up to 30% of installation costs and the introduction of a fair price for wind power. Danes also expressed strong anti-nuclear sentiments that led the Danish parliament to exclude the use of nuclear energy in its future energy planning in 1985, making wind the ideal candidate in Denmark's attempt to shift away from fossil fuels. This is in contrast with Finland which has been fulfilling almost 20% of its total energy needs with nuclear power since the 1980s. By the mid-1990s, the Danish government had set ambitious targets. It aimed to service 12-14% to of its total energy energy consumption with renewables by 2005 and 35% by 2030. It also set up the Danish Energy Agency to take charge of the implementation of renewable energy policies. Local wind cooperatives have been another factor in the emergence and success of wind energy in Denmark. Supported by favorable tax incentives, Denmark's environmentally conscious population began to increasingly invest in community-owned wind turbines. By 2001, these cooperatives included more than 100,000 families and were responsible for 86% of all turbines installed countrywide. Cooperatives benefited from lower energy taxes and profit sharing from any electricity that was sold to the grid. This also ensured that the wind energy industry had a strong domestic market to depend on. However, despite strong growth in the 90s, wind energy slumped in the mid-2000s due to policy changes, showing just how much energy policy matters in the adoption of green energy. 
even in otherwise environmentally conscious countries and how subsidizing new technologies in their early years can encourage the transition and result in increased technological advancement in the long run. The new government in the 2000s aimed to encourage competition in the renewable energy market and introduced policies that resulted in a significant decline in the premium wind power had previously enjoyed. This resulted in a rapid decline in wind power capacity and no new cooperatives were formed between 2003 and 2008 while many existing ones sold their assets. The stagnation ended in 2009 following a revival of political support for wind energy and a new policy mechanism based on an environmental premium on top of the market price and additional compensation for balancing costs was introduced. While these costs were initially passed on to the consumer, from 2022 onwards, funds for renewable energy projects will come from the Danish government, which is also seeking to curtail the number of onshore wind turbines in favor of repowering them and encouraging further growth in offshore wind, a sector that has already taken off. All said and done though, Denmark still meets 60% of its energy demand from fossil fuels, and has a long way to go in meeting its target to completely end oil and gas exploration and production by 2050. However, Denmark has all the necessary tools it needs to succeed in its mission. The only question, I believe, is how quickly it will do so. According to Mordor Intelligence, Denmark's wind energy market is expected to have a compound annual growth rate of around 5% over the next few years. This will be driven by government goals and efforts to have low-cost, more sustainable, cleaner energy. A growing offshore market is also encouraging more companies to enter the industry. Denmark's wind energy market is moderately fragmented and key players include Orstedes, Vattenfall AB and Vestas Wind Systems, while the Danish offshore wind market is dominated by Siemens Wind Power and Vestas Offshore Wind.